Welcome to Razorback Reels. I'm Connor Marsh. And I'm Gigi Kramer. Thank you for joining us. Entertainment news has been ablaze this week, so it's only fitting that we begin our show discussing all the best headlines. Starting with a collaboration between the biggest names in toys and video games, LEGO announced a brand new wave of Animal Crossing sets. Five sets will be released in March of 2024. So for right now, all we have is some teaser images. Connor, will you be purchasing any of these sets? Uh, probably not with my bank account, but uh, it'd definitely be a cool set to get. I mean, I'm not much of an Animal Crossing fan, but these are definitely cool sets. Uh, they've got like the Mario stuff going on too, yeah. so big Nintendo push for Lego. I think I'll definitely have to pick up at least one. I have 400 hours in Animal Crossing, which is the lowest of all my friends that play that game, but it's still a game that I really enjoy, and who doesn't love Legos? Yeah, so. you can rack up some hours in Animal Crossing. Yeah. <laughs> No, I think some of the minifigs look creepy, but overall the sets are really cute. So I'm looking forward to hopefully picking some up and building them. Awesome. Uh, well, speaking of childhood things we all adore, I Carly ended for the second time. The Paramount Plus reboot ended after three seasons. The final episode ended with a cliffhanger, a tease at the identity of Carly and Spencer's mom. Gigi, did you turn into this reboot? So I actually tried to get really into it over the summer, but I started at the third season and I got really confused because, you know, Paramount loads the most recent season, even if you haven't watched any of it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, they're referencing all these plot things and I don't know what's going on. So then I stopped watching it. Yeah, I watched the first season when it came out. Uh, it wasn't really for me. Mm -hmm. I think it you shouldn't have done a reboot without all of them there. Yeah. But it was still a good show. I don't know. It was all right. Like, I'd give it like a six out of ten. Maybe I'd watch it once or twice a week. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Not something I'd binge watch, though. Um, while the iconic iCarly theme song was a hit back in the 2000s, we're looking forward to the crowning hit, the song of 2023. The Grammys may not be until February, but artist campaigns are already starting. The eligibility periods for the 2024 awards just closed on September 15th. Connor, do you have any predictions? Yes, I have a lot to say about the Grammys. <laughs> okay, first up, album of the year. I'm going to give it to either Olivia Rodrigo Guts or one of my personal favorites of the year, I doubt it'll get nominated, but Little Yachty released a uh, psychedelic rock album that was really, really good. What about you? I'd probably give Album of the Year to Guts. I hope and pray that Olivia's gonna sweep this year. Um, I know her last Grammys was all right, but I think Guts was huge and she's closer to the end of the nomination period. Um, what about Best New Artist? Best I mean, Ice Spice is probably going to take it. I'd give it to Ice Spice. I'm not sure if Boy Genius will be eligible because the new artist rules are a little bit tricky, yeah. but um, I'm hoping they'll get a nomination maybe, but I think I'd give it to Ice Spice probably. Shout out to Sabrina Carpenter as well, <laughs> Sabrina. Uh, and Song of the Year, what's some, what's some of the best songs? Um, I think Antihero will be nominated. Personally, I'm hoping Vampire or... Is Kill Bill's in this Yeah, cycle? Kill Bill. Maybe Kill Bill. I love that song so much. Um, I forgot to say SZA for Album of the Year. Yeah. SOS is my Album of the Year. SZA I mean, deserves it. Yeah, Taylor's going to be nominated. I don't know how much she'll win because yeah. Midnight's was successful, but I think a lot of people, it's like not their favorite Taylor album. So right. we'll just have to see. I'm excited to tune in. Yeah. Uh, while we're too far out to cover the Grammys, wins, and snubs, we can crown the winners and losers of the week. For our next segment of the night, we have winners and losers. Our in-studio reporters will be breaking down who's on top and who's in their flop era each week. Razorback Reels reporter Elena Thompson is here with the weekly breakdown. So we all know the drama surrounding Ariana Grande, her husband Dalton Gomez, and the SpongeBob star, but there have been some new developments. Dalton Gomez and Ariana Grande have settled their divorce only weeks after filing for a separation. The pair had a prenup agreement, and Ariana Grande wrote Gomez a check for over a million dollars, which makes him the first winner of the night in my book. Granted, this one's a little bit bittersweet because they did just get a divorce, but at least Gomez got a good chunk of money to make him feel better. Moving on to the loser of the night, I am going to say it's literally anybody who attended Paris Fashion Week. While the looks there were gorgeous and many of those in attendance looked stunning, one very small thing makes them losers. And actually, it's more like a million tiny things. For those of you who don't know, Paris is facing a bed bug infestation. The infestation began right before Fashion Week started, and the bugs have been in hotels, rental spaces, public transit, and even in hospitals. What's worse is that they have evolved and are now resistant to insecticides that would normally kill them. 
It's possible that Fashion Week will become a super spreader event and that those who were there will bring the bed bugs back overseas on clothing and in luggage. Maybe the bed bugs are actually the winners of the week and this is their first step to taking over the world. That's all the time that I have. I'm going to send it back to our anchors, Connor and Gigi. For Razorback Reels, I'm Elena Thompson. Thanks, Elena, for the recap of the winners, or I guess losers, in the world this week. I guess it could really go either way, um, especially with Ariana Grande and Ethan Slater. I think That so. might be the wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, my inner theater kid was kind of living in that drama because, you know, they're on the set of Wicked right now, um, and there's always a little showmance going on, so that was... I know a lot of former theater kids like myself were a little confused at why Cat Valentine and SpongeBob were dating. Um, Keep but it in the Nickelodeon family. For real. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, and what about bed bugs in Paris? I mean, oh that's God. crazy. It, that's insane. Um, I couldn't imagine going to an event like Fashion Week too, some some like high prestigious event. Yeah. And getting bed bugs from it. Well, and you're staying in probably like a luxury hotel, so. Right. Exactly. I know, like. We always check for bed bugs at our hotels, but if I was in a five-star place, I probably wouldn't even think to. Yeah, I guess go for the fashion, leave with the bed bugs. I, maybe the bed bugs are looking out for those fashion week fits. Like, they want to be stylish. So. Right, exactly. <laughs> I uh, well, coming up after the break, we'll be putting on our records and dancing to our favorite tunes. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Razorback Reels. Our next segment, Hogwild Harmonies, covers all things music. Here to talk about one of the industry's biggest album releases of the year, we have Carly Kidd in studio. Well, the Dogs by Drake has finally dropped. The album is composed of 23 songs and was supposed to drop September 22nd, but instead it dropped October 6th, making fans very excited for its arrival. Drake needs no introduction. The R&B and rap artist has won 193 awards in the course of his career, five of those being Grammys. A lot of his awards come from his old albums, such as Views and What a Time to Be Alive. Drake claimed we would get an old taste of Drake in the album, but he surprised us with a new version of himself. Without further ado, let's talk about the album and the many features that are included. Drake kicks off his album with the song Virginia Beach, which uses a sample track by Frank Ocean. In this song, Drake talks about the ups and downs of a relationship he had and how he yearns for the early stages of it. The beautiful sample track by Frank Ocean is called Wise Man, which was originally supposed to be used in the movie Django Unchained. Unfortunately, Tarantino could not find a scene for Wise Man to be used in, but Drake certainly could. The next song is called Amen, featuring Tizo Touchdown. In the beginning of the song, Tizo is thanking the Lord for everything he has done for him. This is his first song with Drake, and with how much the fans love him, there will definitely be more to come. The third track off the album is called Calling for You, featuring 21 Savage. This song explores relationships and desires. In the first part of the song, we hear Drake talking about his encounter with a young woman who's beautiful, but since she is young, he knows she doesn't have much experience in life. He, can tell, he tells her he can't fully commit to her because of who he is. On the other hand, you have 21 Savage discussing confrontations and his dominance. This song focuses on the challenges fame brings in the intimate relationships. The sixth track on the album, First Person Shooter, featuring J. Cole, is undoubtedly a favorite by everyone. J. Cole, J. Cole and Drake talk about their success and status in the rap industry. Drake compares them to being bigger than a Super Bowl game, while J. Cole notes that they are the top two artists in their genre. While J. Cole was expected to make an appearance on the album, no one saw the next collaboration coming. Slime You Out, featuring SZA, is more an R&B type tone. This song dives deep into both Drake and SZA being used by their ex-lovers while sharing how they both use some of their ex-lovers, hence the term Slime You Out, meaning to use someone. To, con to conclude the album, he uses Polar Opposites, an emotional, captivating song that he lets us see how complex relationships this day and age are. Drake starts the song with a beautiful sample track, which goes into how he was treated differently by his partner and how opposite they are. He emphasizes many moments of intimacy and confusion during this relationship. This song makes fans visualize a beautiful background with the Atlantic Ocean with the sunset. Drake picked the perfect way to end his album. It allows listeners to explore many themes, such as human connections and relationships. 
Once again, Drake has blessed the music industry, and I highly recommend everyone to give this album a listen. Reporting for Razorback Reels, I'm Carly Kidd. Thanks, Carly, for that recap of Drake's eighth studio album. Gigi, did you listen to For All the Dogs? Um, a little bit, not a ton. Um, I would say I listen to a lot of music, but I don't listen to a ton of R&B and rap. So what were your thoughts on the album? I thought it was good. Um, I think a lot of people are way too, uh, have too high of hopes for Drake. <laughs> it definitely was not old Drake. Mm -hmm. uh, it definitely wasn't old Drake, but I still thought it was a pretty good album. I mean, the features on the album were really good. Uh, apparently, the Yeet song is, and the J. Cole song are competing as to who will get number one on the Billboard right now oh. for next week. Uh, the Slime You Out with SZA was a really good song, the lead single from the album. Uh, what I did not expect was, uh, I believe it's called Rich Baby Daddy um, with SZA and Sexy Red. Uh, a lot of people are critical of Sexy Red's performance, and that's fine. Uh, sh if you don't enjoy her type of music, you're not going to enjoy this song. Uh, but SZA is a really good feature on anything, and it, it's just a fun song. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I thought the album was a lot of fun, and uh, definitely not album of the year worthy or anything. Uh, well, I'll definitely be giving it a listen then. The music industry is full of shining stars from all over the world, but one ballroom in Hollywood is home to some of the most dance worthy. That's right. We're talking about none other than Dancing with the Stars. In our next segment, Reality Recap, we have Razorback Reels reporter Katie Glanton here to break down this season's spectacular start. The 32nd season of Dancing with the Stars started two weeks ago on September 26th, and one thing's for sure, it is a very interesting season. I'm Katie Glanton. Let's get into everything that's happened on the first two episodes. First things first, the season got a whole new host in Julian Huff, as Tyra Banks, who has been a host since season 29, stepped down. It was a shock to me as Tyra was the host when I started watching. Huff was previously a dance pro on the show and has been even been a guest judge on multiple seasons of the show. She joins Alfonso Rivero in this role, returning the, the shows to its original two-host format. Another unexpected change this season has to do with the coveted trophy. This happened when, that when Lynn, Good, Lynn Goodman, the head judge for Dancing with the Stars since the series' inception, for the last few seasons, died it passed away in the spring of this year. To honor him, the Mirrorball Trophy was named after him. Now the Lynn Goodman Mirrorball Trophy. The lineup of stars this season was very diverse, as there's TV stars like Jamie Lynn Spears and Allison Hannigan, as well as stars from sports and social media like Adrian Peterson and Lele Pons. The first episode did not have a theme as it, as it has in the past, so it was fun seeing different stars show off their personality in all different kinds of songs and dances. My personal favorite for episode one was singer Jason Mraz, who danced with his partner Daniela Karagoff to his own song, I Feel Like Dancing. The judges must have agreed with me as he got one of the highest scores for episode one with a 21 out of 30. Unfortunately, every week someone has to go home. In the first week, it was Matt Walsh and his partner Coco Iwasaki. They were the bottom two with Mauricio Imanski and his partner Emma Slater. The second week was Latin Night, where the stars danced to Latin style songs. One feature dance was Sochi Gomez and her partner Val Smirkovsky, who danced to a Camila Cabello song and gave them the highest score of the night and the highest for the season so far at a 24 out of 30. The bottom two for the night was Jamie Lynn Spears and her partner Alan Burstein and Adrian Peterson and his partner Britt Stewart. Unfortunately, for all Zoe 101 fans, Jamie Lynn was the one to go home. Well, who knows what will happen next, but be sure to catch Dancing with the Stars every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. on Disney Plus and ABC. This has been Katie Glanton with Razorback Reels. Recapping who is dancing their way to the top this season, Katie. Gigi, what do you think about Dancing with the Stars? I have a lot of nostalgia for that show. That's one of the first shows I remember tuning into with my mom every week when it came on, like that and American Idol. I think it's very sad that Lynn died and it's gonna be very different because he was always pretty critical. He of was a the staple of the dancers, show. He was there so. from the very beginning. Yeah, so. I just imagine how the dynamic of the judges has changed, which I feel like is such an iconic part of the show, so. Right. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you know any of the contestants on this season? I only know a couple. I know a few. I'm surprised how many like social media people they're bringing yeah. in the past few seasons, especially because um, I know I've heard of Lele Pons. I've never been a fan of hers, but I think she and Jamie Lynn are the only ones that I had like heard buzz about. Uh -huh. So a lot of this cast seems to be uh, on a reality TV tour of mm -hmm. sorts. I know Jamie Lynn Spears and uh, Lele Pons have done a few reality shows in the past year. 
some of the people on it just feels like this is the next reality show for me. Yeah. Uh, which is fine, but I don't know. I, I it's, it's always interesting to see how they perform, and sometimes I feel like they bring in stars that are not great dancers just to have them there. Right. <laughs> but coming up, we'll be diving into the wonderful world of film. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Razorback Reels. Our next segment, Hogging the Popcorn, covers all things movies. Martin Scorsese's film career has spanned decades and he ha shows no sign of slowing down. Here to discuss the impact of this Hollywood titan is Razorback Reels reporter Noah Kim. How are we doing, Reels fanatics? I'm Noah Kim here to talk about Hollywood's own Italian stallion, Martin Scorsese. Now, due to ongoing sag after strike, I will not be talking about his upcoming movie, Redacted of the Redacted, Redacted starring Redacted DiCaprio, Redacted Gladstone, and Brendan Fraser. But that's okay, because Scorsese has directed a couple of movies in the past, and last I checked, the unions have not asked for a boycott on watching older movies, so let's get right into it. Martin Scorsese grew up in Little Italy, and he was just pre-wired to be obsessed with movies. I mean, dude, watched so many foreign films way long before art school attendees with no friends downloaded Letterboxd. And when it came time for Scorsese to think about his career, he figured he should follow his dreams to become a priest. But then he failed seminary school, so he went for plan B, NYU film school. And so began Scorsese's long climb up the filmmaking ladder, making short films here, working as an AD there, and even editing a couple of documentaries in between. Now, the first of Scorsese's features is Mean Streets, a gritty look at crime and religious redemption in Little Italy. This movie functioned like a mirror of Scorsese's upbringing. This movie garnered quite a, a lot of buzz, so leaving many to be excited for uh, Scorsese's next major feature, Taxi Driver. I'm gonna walk on eggshells here because as a white dude, I do not wanna to appear to like this movie too much because then I would be put on an FBI watch list. Taxi Driver is a story about a social outcast that finds himself alienated from society. The dreary cinematography and unsettling shot compositions give this movie a very distinct personality. Scorsese began his working relationship with screenwriter Paul Schrader because of this movie's success. Now, Raging Bull was the next major film in Scorsese's repertoire and uh, he decided to shoot in a black and white film so it could stand out amongst the other popular boxing movies at the time. Rocky, Rocky too, you know. I'm sure everyone's ADHD is now clamoring for me to wrap this up, so I'm gonna rapid fire through the high points of Scorsese's career. King of Comedy, great movie, although I personally think the Joker shamelessly ripped off a majority of it. Goodfellas, there's really nothing I can say about this movie that hasn't already been said. Stop whining about the long runtime and just watch it. Trust me, it flies by. The Aviator, kind of mid. Uh, but in my opinion, uh, mid by Scorsese standards makes it better than most Marvel movies. The Departed, one of the best adaptations of a foreign film and the star-studded cast, all speaking in hokey Boston accents, never ceases to amaze me. And uh, The Wolf of Wall Street, overall it's had a net negative impact on smarmy trust fund business majors, but it's a pretty funny romp overall. And The Irishman, watching this movie does take up a sixth of the day, but I swear it serves as a high watermark for Scorsese's maturing as a filmmaker. Please watch it. Now, as I wrap up, I have to give a major shout out to the thousands of people employed by Scorsese throughout his career. Filmmaking is a, a collaborative art form that requires a lot from the working people behind the scenes. Profit motives harm the creation of impactful movies like Scorsese's, so please show solidarity to the, worker to the workers as they fight for livable wages. For Razorback Reels, I'm Noah Kim. Thanks, Noah. Scorsese's film career spans nearly 60 years. Uh, Gigi, have you seen any of these movies? I have not, but I have seen many clips of The Wolf of Wall Street, and my dad would always joke that coffee is for closers when we're going on long weekends of camping, so even though I have not watched his movies, they still have made an impact in my life, just as he's impacted the film industry as a whole. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> only one I've seen is Wolf of Wall Street, but it's an incredible film. Uh, I need to see Goodfellas. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a really iconic movie. Mm -hmm. Moving on, moving from a Hollywood director to one a bit closer to home, Professor Larry Foley of the School of Journalism is off campus this semester working on a new documentary film. Foley says this is a story of faith, hardship, and resilience. Journalism student Gracie Tootie, Tui has been in the Arkansas's Delta working as a production team member and has this report from the Arkansas Cotton Fields. 
Hello, this is Gracie Tuohy, and I'm coming to you from the cotton fields of Southeast Arkansas. I'm here today in Lake Village with Larry Foley and his team while they're working on the documentary of Cries from the Cotton Field. Uh, Larry, tell me a little bit about what you guys were shooting here today. Well, we came down here to film cotton because this is a story about Italians who immigrated to this area to pick cotton, and uh, the conditions were so bad, and in fact, they turned deadly that uh, they were ultimately, at least some of them, were let out of here. So we wanted to come and film the cotton and do a reenactment of the priest who was one of their leaders, Father mm -hmm. Bandini. Oh, very interesting. I'm looking forward to it coming out. So when can we expect that release date? Well, we're working on it now. We'll be uh, wrapping field production soon. This is our wrap in southeast Arkansas. Uh, I'm telling people expect it winter 24. Awesome. Well, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gracie. This is Gracie Tui coming to you from Lake Village, Arkansas. Thank you. Uh, Professor Foley says to watch for screenings sometime this winter or early spring. Professor Foley isn't the only artist found here in Fayetteville. The Associated Student Government announced that the band The Greeting Committee is performing at this Chancellor's Ball this Thursday. Rounding out our NWA artist highlight, world-famous musician Sting will be passing through the Walmart Amp on October 12th. That's all the time we have for this episode of Razorback Reels. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Razorback underscore Reels. I'm Gigi Kramer. And I'm Connor Marsh. Thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great night.